Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to Conversations with Julia Craven. I am Julia Craven. And today I am chatting with Jamel Bowie. He is a New York, a New York Times colonist, columnist. Wow, I cannot talk today, y'all. <laughs> um, <laughs> but we're going to be discussing a couple of things. Um, we're going to talk about the attacks on Senator Kamala Harris's identity, Trump's scramble to stay in the White House, and how our current electoral politics causes folks to sometimes reimagine previous administrations. And next week, I will be back for our last show, and hopefully I can talk better. Um, but how are you doing today, Jamel? I'm doing pretty good, pretty ordinary day, as far as things go. That's good, that's good. I'm glad that you're having an ordinary day during extraordinary times. Um, so let's let's get started. Um, in your most recent article for the Times, you wrote about the attacks on Senator Harris's identity. Um, and so, just give us an overview, or give people who are watching an overview of that story. Sure. Uh, so Senator Harris is uh, of Jamaican and uh, Indian descent. Her mother. As Tamil, her father is uh, from Jamaica. They're both immigrants to the States, uh, students um, studying, I think her mother um, in, in medicine and her father, uh, actually I, I, I forget what her father is studying, not material to this, but that's her background. Uh, and she has been, when she was chosen or when Joe Biden announced that she would be his running mate, sort of every headline was, you know, first African-American woman on a national ticket, uh, first black woman on a national ticket, first Asian American on a national ticket. And from some corners, and I, I, I picked out two conservative voices, uh, there is an immediate pushback that you know, Harris is not uh, African American, Harris is not black, she is of Jamaican uh, descent, that's not the same thing. Um, one of her ancestors was a slave owner, uh, you know, that that's also in the, in the argument that also is a uh, cause to reconsider her identity. And mm -hmm. in my column, I, I push back on those those two immediate points, like really quickly, just to note um, for readers that you know Jamaica was one of the centers of the transatlantic slave trade. Received you know hundreds of thousands right. of enslaved people over the course of the 18th century, um, uh, and also that uh, plenty of African, plenty of Black Americans, um, people descended from. Uh, uh, enslaved Africans here, um, plenty of you know, black people wherever there was uh, chattel slavery in the Americas pro have descendants who are their ancestors rather who are uh, who were themselves enslavers because of pervasive sexual violence right. um, within the institution, and so it's not really much of a gotcha to that Harris is directly descended from a slave owner. A lot of <laughs> <laughs> a lot of black people right. are. Um, that's kind of part of the territory. Uh, but the, the the most of the, so the column spends a little bit of time kind of dealing with those, but most of it is really an attempt to explain uh, what it actually means to say that someone is black. I try for the sake of clarity to draw a distinction between say someone's African-American and saying someone is black. Those terms have meant different things over the years, but right now what they seem to mean is that African-American is someone who is directly descended from enslaved Africans in the United States. And a black person is sort of a member of the African diaspora, um, whether here or in you know, Great Britain or in, uh, in South America. And so black Americans tends to refer to you know, people of African descent in the United States, regardless of where they come from, originally. Right. And uh, I try to spend, I, try, I basically try to explain that, you know, the reason why so many different groups of people of African descent in this country identify as Black American has less to do with anything intrinsic to being of African descent. It has nothing to do with anything intrinsic to being of African descent and everything to do with sort of the shape of American racism and the shape of American society over the course of many years. And it is the, you know, it is both, it is the conditions in which people of African descent have found themselves in the United States, which has created this group identity. And that's kind of, that's the context for it. Um, 
And Harris, you know, the reason why I think you can fairly say that she is a black American is that Harris too, you know, grows up in that community, um, is part of a family that adopts uh, that identity because of the, the conditions which they find themselves as well. So that's sort of what the the piece is trying to do um, is provide for people kind of both a, a historical and theoretical background for understanding why people call themselves black and why that's included lots of people who, you know, aren't of African descent uh, or aren't rather aren't of uh, descent from American enslaved people. So like, you know, a famous example is, um, Marcus Garvey, who is sort of a, a pretty seminal figure in Black American history, is himself from Jamaica. Um, uh, right. More recently, obviously, Barack Obama, uh, his father is from Kenya. Colin Powell, his family is from Jamaica. Uh, Shirley Chisholm, um, her family is from, uh, I think, British Guiana and Barbados. I mean, if you kind of just start to go down the list, you find lots of prominent Black Americans whose families are not descended from American slaves. and the piece basically tries to answer, well, why do they call themselves black Americans? And yeah. Right. And I think you do a great job of that in the piece. And one thing that really stood out to me, <clears throat> excuse me, was um, when you said that this is an opportunity or this is a moment where we should be thinking more deeply about the contours of racial identity. And so how do you propose people do that? Uh, you know, I think, Sort of, I think the important points, um, and I, I alluded to them before, are to really understand that uh, these things are contingent, meaning that um, they aren't, they, they they don't emerge out of some essential attribute. Um, had had the his history in North America gone differently, there may have never been black people, right? Like that's that's a right. the construction is a product of a specific history and specific moments in time. Um, and so that's sort of the starting point that you you have to avoid essentializing this. You have to really historicize your understanding, um, and then also understand that people contain overlapping identities, uh, multiple and overlapping. That it's not, you know, even even within Black America, people can identify themselves as Black and also identify themselves as, you know, I have direct European ancestry from a white parent. Or, you know, I'm a Black American, but my parents are from Nigeria, right? Sort of the, uh, and this isn't, I mean, I'm using Black Americans right now because that's what the piece is about, but this is sort of true across the board uh, in terms of American identity, right? That like there are <clears throat> uh, white Americans who identify, who are, you know, first or second generation immigrants um, from, you know, Europe or the parents and identify strongly with that national background, um, uh, in addition to claiming an American identity. Now, you know, obviously the question of what is white identity is a separate one and equally complicated <laughs> yeah. and not the same at all. Um, but it's true that, you know, I, I'm an American, I'm an Italian, I'm, you know, I'm a Southerner, right? Sort of people have all these overlapping identities that are all historically situated and, um, at the very least, when thinking and talking about identity, we should really avoid saying a person is singularly one thing or 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 denying that a person can be a thing without really kind of unpacking what that what that even mean. And my inclination generally is not to like, you know, if someone says, uh, if someone says, you know, I'm a black American, I'm not gonna my instinct is not to immediately deny that. Like I'm not gonna say no. Um uh right. In fact, I don't think I there's I can't think of a situation in which I would say no. Uh, it'd have to be, you know, something very, very extremely unusual. Um, but that's sort of I mean that's what I mean when I say think more deeply. Just like not not to take this stuff um, as representing essential qualities. To think about it critically and think about it in terms of uh, history and, and what it means in those terms and um, not, you know, that's what that means for me versus what we saw uh, over the past week with Harris, which is sort of this not attempt to understand, but attempt to, you know, wall off and close off and create boundaries um, for very, I think, suspect reasons. Right. It's always interesting. Um, well, I guess interesting isn't necessarily the right word, but well, 
I'll just I'll just hand this to you. Did you did you expect the current um, conversation that we're um, that others are having about Harris's identity to happen? I figured it would, you know, when she ran, when she announced her campaign for president last um, last year, last January, I believe, not 2020, but 2019, um, there was a mm-hmm. conversation about her identity, as, you know, her identifying as black. And uh, she had, did, I think, several interviews about that when she ran for statewide office in California. This came up also as well through all this, her conversations about her Asian American identity and heritage. Um, uh, and, you know, frankly, the president of the United States uh, came to influence uh, kind of throwing uh, suspicion on the background of Barack Obama um, for purely, mm-hmm. you know, obviously racist reasons. And so in, in terms of that that aspect of all of this, kind of the, you know, the birtherism and that sort of thing, that's almost inevitable given who the president is, right? Like he's going to obviously yeah. try that again um, since it worked for him the first time. Um, so I totally expected this would happen. And that's why I sort of refer to it all as an opportunity that like, it really is a chance to kind of step back mm-hmm. and sort of figure out um, what it means when we say certain things uh, and what the implications of that are. Absolutely. And would you, would you say the attack, the attacks are, <clears throat> sorry, y'all allergies cutting up today. Um, would you say the attacks are indicative of race as an ideology uh, versus you, you, a literal biological thing? Could you could you just say? Could you say? I'm not sure. I, I um, understand the question. Could you could you, could you pack, unpack it a little bit for me? Of course. And so when I was reading your piece, one thing that I was one thing that was kind of turning around in my mind was like, wow. Um, the attacks on Harris's identity are very indicative, at least to me, that race is something that people made up. It's something that they pick and choose when to attack people based on it. And then the attacks just kind of shape shift depending on the person who is the target. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think that's right. Um, I, you know, the, the, the basic truth of all of this is that race is a constructed category um, that it's, you know, the reason I like writing so much is I can be really precise here and I'm a little less precise when I'm speaking, but the, the thing to understand with regards to say black Americans is that black Americans created a culture for themselves, but they didn't create themselves as a race, right? Like it wasn't the case that enslaved Africans said to themselves, well, we all have similar skin color and similar uh, features and phenotypes. So therefore we must belong to the same, some category of humanity. Rather the people who enslaved Mm -hmm. them said, in order to justify the enslavement and to justify sort of the, the, material basis in which they've constructed their society said, oh, those people are of a different order of humanity than us. They are, they are a race. And so that's sort of, that's the, I think one thing, the important thing to understand is that's sort of the direction of causation. Like races don't exist mm-hmm. naturally in the world. They're things that we, impo- they're an attempt to impose a kind of order on um, uh, a set of uh, circumstances and specifically um, the circumstances are how do we, you know, how do we justify um, these institutions of domination, exploitation, and such? Um, and the answer that you know some folks 400 years ago came up with, or 500 years ago came up with, was um, we will essentialize this. We'll buy. We'll make it a question, a question of biology, um, to justify you know why we're doing this. Uh, and I think you can see th- the extent to which um, there are, you know, with Obama, with Harris, with um, many figures, there, there's this attempt to sort of um, deem what they are and what they aren't. I think it's you can you can understand that as an echo of the kind of impulse that uh, created race in the first place. Um, yeah. Gotcha. And so now let's move on to Trump, 
because I was I was going through your stories this morning and I just saw so much stuff. I was like, we can talk about so many things. Um, and so in one of your pieces, you pretty much the point is that Trump is losing. He's not polling very well, et cetera. And you say, Trump is desperate to hold on to power, but he probably can't win in a fair fight. And I wanted to have you unpack that for the people who are watching, because I think it's a very powerful, succinct analysis of what's happening right now. Yeah, I mean, if you just um, if you just like take a look at the at the the fundamentals, the polls, the economy, all that stuff, um, it's clear that Trump is behind. I mean, he is, I think, in most averages is, is around eight points behind Biden. Um, before COVID, he was around five points behind. So he's never really been ahead. He's never broken mm-hmm. 50% in approval. He's only a, a handful of times broken 46 or 47% in approval, but he's consistently been in the low 40s. Um, if you look at his disapproval, you know, majorities have high disapproval. Not just, you know, it's something like 58 to 59% of people disapprove of him, but of that number, most of those people are kind of firm and um, uh, really intense in their disapproval of the president. And that's never not been the case. Uh, uh, you know, the economy is not great. His campaign, on account of him ignoring the pandemic, his campaign um, is completely unfocused on kind of that central issue. And so if we had a fair fight, which to me means if everyone who wanted to vote could just go and vote however they chose, Mm -hmm. with no obstacles, with no worried about delayed ballots, with none of that, just just every single person decided I'm going to vote in the election could go cast a ballot and that that vote was counted, um, I think Trump would lose pretty decisively. I don't really think there's a question about that at this point. Even before the pandemic, there was not really any, no one really thought he'd ever be able to win a majority of votes um, or even the most votes. The assumption was that if he won, it would be because of the Electoral College, because his coalition is in the right places um, such that he doesn't have to win the most votes. But I think given all things equal um, in terms of access to the polls, he loses, no question. And I think he knows that. I think his team knows that. I think everyone around him knows that that's his position. And so what we're witnessing now is attempt to kind of throw, create chaos around the election, whether that is in terms of the delivering of ballots, the um, reception of ballots, how how, states and localities take them up, the counting of ballots, you know, all this stuff we've seen over the last week. I think it's very much an attempt to create chaos with the aim of A, maybe bringing people to be so distrustful of the system if they don't vote at all. B, if they do vote and they do so in a way by mail, absentee, that it takes time to count the votes, that there, that time between election night and the final count is an opportunity um, for him to you know, say, well, those ballots are fake, I won. Um, and then C, I think I've been doing ABC. So I, sometimes I do like the A1, <laughs> but I've been doing ABC. So I think. And C, uh, it's very clearly uh, an attempt to, you know, if he if he loses on election night and the votes are counted and he's, it's determined he's lost, you know, for good, to still create grounds to say, well, I didn't really lose. I, I, I contested this. Um, and I don't know. For as much as people should be vigilant about the election, that they shouldn't take things for granted, that they shouldn't, that you know, that all the things you've heard over the last couple of years, right? All those things are true. Right. But I, I, I think it's important, and I've, I've believed this to be the case from the beginning, to not buy Trump's own hype about himself, that he isn't actually, he doesn't float above political water. He, he's subject to political gravity um, that he's not he's not like some you know dark warlock of politics he's like a guy who right. figured out a way to win without winning the most votes it barely worked the first time it's not really working now and he has to um you know try to throw democracy in the chaos for it to for him to have any chance of prevailing i think though that's the that's where we are right now 
Yeah, he kind of reminds me of um, Selena Meyer from Veep in that way. <laughs> when you, yeah, like how he's not like this political mastermind um, who, who has this position. But we do have an audience question that is pretty much the same as what I was about to ask you. So I'm gonna bring it in. It's from John D. And he asked, do you think the USPS situation is proof that Trump does not intend to fight fairly? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's proof positive that he doesn't intend to fight fairly. Um, sort of the you know the the very opportunistic attacks on mail-in voting are proof. Um, I mean, it, it's I mean the thing is that, that and I said this I think in that column that everyone kind of knows what he's going to do, right? Like if if it's November third, mm -hmm. it's you know ten p.m. and it looks like there's still a lot of a lot of uh, ballots have yet to be counted, but on election night, he has a lead. He'll say, oh, I won. And he'll try to get the states to certify that without counting those extra ballots. Um, that's obviously right. the plan. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, it kind of, the the part of the question will be going into that. Um, you know, if he, if he is looking like he's going to hold a lead on election night is how does the rest of the political system respond to that very obvious attempt to do that thing? And I think what we're seeing is that, you know, people would be, you know, I think would respond with the necessary pushback. And I'm not necessarily talking about elected officials, I'm talking about sort of ordinary people, um, people on the ground mm -hmm. uh, who I, I have a feeling would end up protesting uh, and making it very clear that the ballots have to be counted. Right. And so do you think that this kind of do you do you think that this clashes with how a lot of Americans perceive America and the way it functions? And what I mean by that is if there is a massive just clusterfuck um, with voting on election night and Trump says that he won and people have to protest the results, do you think that that image kind of just butts heads with how people perceive or how they think our systems work in this country. Absolutely. I mean, I think this is the kind of thing that will, you know, if, 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 if that's what we're staring down on November 4th, um, mm -hmm. a result that strongly suggests Biden has won, but we still have to count all the ballots, a president who is claiming victory and demanding that those ballots are thrown out. Um, if that's what we're facing and the, the response to it, right, is you know protest for the counting of ballots? I think that will force a lot of Americans to re if they, if they have if they haven't already to reevaluate what they believed about this democracy. And I don't think that's a bad thing because I think you know mm -hmm. already a group of Americans, and this is you know to go back to our previous part of our conversation, Black Americans who have not lived in uh, a a real democracy for very long, um, for about as long as my parents have been right. alive is about the, about the amount of time the black Americans have been able to say, yeah, we live in a, a democracy that you know, kind of counts our voice, our votes and cares what we think. Um, and if more Americans came to an understanding that this democracy often isn't worthy of a name, um, that needs a tremendous amount of work, um, that all the same must be defended, um, it's still very fragile, I think we'd be in a better place. Um, and I think if we can get through this, you know, if, if Trump loses and we can get through all of this, I think hopefully, um, not, I don't think, hopefully it'll provide energy for doing the kinds of reforms um, necessary to begin to rebuild uh, this democracy. And another part of, of the of the story um, that you wrote that we were well, that we're still talking about, um, was about voting in person. And so do you think people will show up to the polls to vote in person? I think so. I mean, one of the findings over the past seven years or so of voter ID laws has been that um, to the extent that they don't have an effect, it's often because they cause a backlash and that people end up, you know, turning out in greater numbers in response to them. And I think one effect of this story involved with the USPS over the past week has been a greater awareness on part of all voters, but Democratic voters specifically, that they really need to vote early. They really need to go go to the polls. Um, they can't sort of be complacent here. 
Right. And it seems like a it seems like another situation where the risk of the coronavirus is again kind of clashing with the risk of, of well clashing with what's at stake um just for the for the greater good like we saw earlier this summer yeah that's right and that's i mean that's um sort of given that the supreme court has sort of been on the side of no we're not going to uh, allow any significant changes to how we do elections mm-hmm. in response to uh, COVID-19 I think that's sort of that's the situation that's that's where we are and so in my column I, I basically say that if you are, if, if you're able to you should just go vote in person um, that could mean early early apps early in-person absentee that can mean early voting um, that can mean dropping off your ballot at a designated place that could mean in many states you can do this you can fill out your ballot uh, your mail-in ballot then on election day go to the polling place and give it um, give it to election officials. But uh, my call basically calls for, you know, if if you can accept that risk, that that's what you should do. And if you can't, then just get your ballot in as early as possible. Right. And do you, do you think that, do you think that black voters will accept that risk? Because I, I'm just thinking about all of the black voters I know, um, especially the ones who lived through Jim Crow and all of the black voters who lived through Jim Crow and my family, they primary, like they, they have already showed up. Um, so do you think that that is a trend that we will see for, for black voters? Do you, do you think that they are going to turn out to the polls regardless? Uh, you know, I, that's, it's, it's hard to say there's, you know, Black turnout in the primaries is pretty high. Black turnout in 2018 was fairly high. It was high in the 2017 elections in Virginia and Alabama. Um, so I would, I would mm-hmm. expect that to continue. Um, but this is going to be a high turnout election in general. I think the projections right now is it might be the highest turnout presidential election in you know a century. Um, so I think everyone, as far as, as, as much as you can get everyone to go vote, I think this is going to be one of those years where... Um, as many people as possible are going to go try to cast a ballot, either against Trump or for him. Right. And so we have another question from Calming Waves, um, which sounds so soothing as a Facebook name. Um, With the poll numbers almost exactly matching the 2016 election, does Biden being ahead mean much right now? So I think that's a reference to a new CNN poll that has the race, I think, at like 50-46 or 51-47, so yeah. just a four-point spread. Um, I would say, you know, my my response to all things about individual polls is that the important thing is the trend, not the headline number. And so if you put mm-hmm. that poll in the context of every poll that's come out in the past like 48 hours, it ends up looking like, you know, CNN has Biden up four, um, I think the NBC Wall Street Journal has them up like 10 or 11. Um, ABC News and uh, Washington Post has them up like 12, right? So it looks like mm-hmm. we have a poll that is within the margin of error, right? Like the margin of error usually is plus or minus five points, but is on the low, uh, it's on the um, the low end of a Biden lead in terms of all potential possibilities. And if you, if you throw all those stuff, all those things into an average of all polls, then you have, depending on kind of how you're weighting each poll, how you're thinking about the relationship between them, anywhere from like a Biden plus seven and a half to a Biden plus nine lead. I tend to say Biden plus eight. That seems like a nice, you know, that that's the the, the middle, the outcome that seems to happen more most often. Um, and compared to 2016, that's just a larger lead than Hillary Clinton ever had. Uh, I think Clinton led by plus two, plus three, plus four generally, but never regularly over any extended amount of time by plus seven, eight, nine, ten, and that's where Biden is. So I would say that the race actually isn't in the same place as it is in 2016. Um, I don't think the numbers, I think one number is similar to where polling was uh, four years ago, but the numbers are not. And one way to think of it is not so much the size of the lead, although that's important, but sort of the 
the consistency with which Biden is ahead, that if you look at individual swing state polls, Biden's not really ever behind. Um, he's tied in Texas, sort of uh, you know, tied in North Carolina, like tied in, tied or near tied in Georgia. Um, but in Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan, Florida, you know, Arizona, it's sort of, it, he has, he holds consistent leads. Um, so that could all change, you know, and it, everything can change. But I, I just don't think the state of the race is, is the same now as it was four years ago. Um, I wish, you know, I wish that lead were larger, right? Like, I think that basically the only way to get out of this in November with like minimal chaos is a decisive Biden lead on election night. Um, but sort of, sort of, there's sort of no way to look at the numbers as they exist and say that, you know, this is a close race. Um, it may become one. It isn't one right now. Gotcha. And so the last thing that I want to bring up um, is revisionist history. And that's pretty much what we pitched you um, to come on and talk about. Um, the current state of our electoral politics is it, it just seems to have people having like of reimagining these very fond memories of the Bush administration. And so I really wanted to get your take on that. Just what have you noticed? Um, what do you think? And why do you think this is? Like, why do you think the current state is causing people to kind of gloss over the horrible things that also happened during past administrations? Yeah, I think there's a couple of things happening. With that, to the extent to the extent that there, that there is sort of like a large number of people with nostalgia for the Bush administration, I think I think a couple of things are happening. The first is that the Bush administration, I think, what the Bush administration was up until very recently worse than this one. I think um, I think COVID kind of right. tips the scale for Trump, and the fact that Trump clearly does not really believe in democracy um, tips the scales. In that direction too, but all these things were present um, were present prior, well, rather were present in the Bush administration. Many of the things that we see with Trump already were in their kind of embryonic forms, or were um, on the march under the Bush administration. And then just thinking in terms of like actual material damage, you know, the Iraq War, Katrina. The financial crisis. I mean, it, the Bush administration was a, a disaster, but I think that because Bush himself was mostly a normal president, because the people around him were mostly normal political types, that it wasn't mm -hmm. um, completely a administration full of grifters and thieves, um, which seems to be the case with the Trump administration. I, that there's a sense that you know, maybe you know, Bush wasn't so bad after all. I think that's wrong, but I can see on kind of a level of aesthetics why people might think that. The other thing is that the anti-Trump coalition, um, which uh, yeah, the anti-Trump coalition comprises a lot of people who voted for Bush. I mean, this I think people overstate the influence of something like the Lincoln Project. But it's true mm -hmm. that a, a non-trivial number of Republican voters have um, switched sides to vote against Trump. And they voted for Bush in 2000 and 2004. They may have voted for McCain in 08, certainly Romney in 2012. And they don't see those years as uh, complete failures. And so for them, you know, there's, there is a, a real reason to look nostalgically back on the Bush years. I think a clear-eyed view of the Bush years would see them very much as kind of laying the groundwork for Trump, both in terms of the particular style of politics um, that Bush and his team engaged on, which was you know, highly divisive, focused not on trying to win majorities as much as trying to you know, slice and dice the electorate into, um, you know, yeah, slice and dice the electorate. And uh, just in terms of the disruption to the economy and to the world, help give someone like Trump a foothold. Wow, I don't think I've ever heard anyone say that the Bush admin kind of laid the groundwork for the current one. So thank you for sharing that. <laughs> and 
<laughs> no, I'm I'm serious. I've I never thought of it that way. Um, I was more so just frustrated with people talking about how Bush paints now, and I'm just like, okay, like that's cool, yeah. I guess. But who cares? <laughs> right. Um, and so the last question is one from a viewer, John Doresky, who asks, besides the racial implications made about Senator Harris, why do you feel the sexist comments were able to fly during this Me Too period? Um, I mean, I, I think the answer to that, to that is just the extent to which you know, sexism is still something that is not, uh, sorry, that might be my dog yelling at me. Um, sexism is something that is uh, still has mainstream purchase. That you can say sexist things, um, and you know it, it's it's acceptable. I'm not acceptable, but like it's not it's not going to generate the same kind of outrage that sort of racist stuff does. Um, and I think that's basically the answer. Mm-hmm. That sexism is still very much a potent force in our politics, and um, Harris being a woman and a black woman specifically is going to. Um, get her, more than hair, more than her share of it. Um, and it's also going to be quite racialized, which hasn't yet manifested, but will, is coming soon enough. Right. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate you coming on. Um, I wish you would have shown us the dog. If I would have known you had a dog, I would have made you show us the dog. <laughs> um, so you lucked out on that one. <laughs> But no, thank you again. Um, And tell people who are watching where to find you. Uh, You can find me at the New York Times. My column usually runs on Tuesdays and Fridays. And then I'm also on CBS News every so often. So um, those are the two places. And on Twitter. Uh, My Twitter is at jbui. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Um, Again, I will be back next week for our last show. Um, and yeah, I hope that y'all are doing okay. I hope you're and wearing sunscreen. All right. See you.